going to be a panel discussion on emerging technologies and their regulation. So we have a moderator here, Dr. Owen O'Sullivan, who is the director for, uh, of the Center for Science, Technology and Innovation Policy at the Department of Engineering in Cambridge. Uh, so his research group mainly looks at emerging technologies and innovation programs. And he's also worked closely with government departments, namely the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, as well as the, the Research Council, the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, in Innovate UK, Research England, and the British Standards Institute as well. So I give the floor to Dr. Okay. Okay. So I think this was also revolution in particular and emerging technologies. Um, so let's say a little bit about that. The fourth industrial revolution is uh, famously the first of the great industrial revolutions to be identified and made without in fact actually having happened yet. Uh, nevertheless, I think the, the potential and the promise of Industry 4.0 to enhance productivity and economic growth is particularly compelling. Clearly there are a range of promising emerging technologies, notably uh, digital technologies, uh, AI, big data, internet of things, cyber-physical systems of various types and so on, which are converging to provide tools and solutions which promise to disrupt uh, the way we make things, the way firms do business, the way industries organize themselves, and even the way we innovate and, and, and do research. Um, for emerging technologies, of course, regulation uh, can catalyze, uh, emerging technologies can catalyze innovation or inhibit innovation. This is well, it's on territory, but I think uh, the fourth industrial revolution is particularly uh, complex. The, the pace of change, the sheer systems complexity, the convergence of the different applications makes it very challenging. And of course, there's issues around privacy and security, and even just knowing what's going on inside the black box of some of these tools is challenging in itself. So this is a very uh, complex uh, environment. And thankfully, however, we have an extremely eminent uh, an accomplished panel who will uh, unravel all this complexity into a um, I'm just going to quickly ask them all some early questions and allow them to introduce themselves. I'm going to introduce them first quickly and then we'll open up to the slide of technology which hopefully works. And then you to send me a trial question so I can see it works. That'd be great. If not, I'll start actually ask questions to real people. Um, I think it already impacted the fourth industrial revolution, which is to remove the role of the panel chair entirely. <laughs> uh, Slido and a moderator box. Yeah. Uh, not, not soon enough. Um, so, we have, as I said, an extraordinarily uh, eminent impressive panel. Um, one of the problems is that their biographies are so long because they're so accomplished. So, I'm just going to very quickly uh, say a few things. Um, going from uh, my right to the left, uh, to Mark Walpole, who is the Chief Executive of UK Research and Innovation, that's the government agency that brings together the different research councils in the UK and Research England. Um, so Mark was um, a hero to many of us during his time as the, the government chief science advisor, uh, former director of the Wellcome Trust, has no time to go into his own career as a career leading immunologist and, and, and professor of medicine. Um, uh, Adriana Machado is a former chief executive of GE Brazil. Uh, founder of the Buya Institute, very interesting benefit corporation bridging innovation in practice and, and sort of socioeconomic purpose. Um, extraordinary mix of, of perspectives from industry and entrepreneurship and policy. Um, Bill Jingwei, uh, partner at, at Warburg Pincus, this legendary uh, US private equity venture capital firm, I think responsible for the, the IT bit of the, the practice, entering industry 3.5 through now. Um, also an economist, did his PhD here in Cambridge, co-founder of the Institute for New Economic Thinking, which is doing very important work, um, and I should say author of the book, Human Capitalism and the Innovation Economy. Uh, a book so good that I own two copies, the first edition and the recently updated second edition. So. Uh, available in all the good shops. Uh, uh, everyone should know at least two copies. Um, yes. um, uh, Claudia Del Posso uh, is the head of operations at C-Mines, again a very interesting uh, organization from a social impact agency, I believe. Um, and they produce some extraordinarily interesting policy reports, pilot projects on a whole range of issues related to the digital economy and related to industry 4.0 from AI to blockchain. It's extremely interesting. Uh, and finally, Sora 
laboratory is the um, uh, Chief Science Officer at Babylon Health, which many of you will know about, and head of AI research, uh, and formerly a uh, researcher at the MRC Center for Outbreak Analysis and Modeling at Imperial. So, a brain's trust to what unravel the emerging technologies and issues to do with regulation. Um, very quickly, so far. Um, interesting to your thoughts. Not least as, as former chief scientist, but also as director of UKRI. I guess for emerging technologies, all of the UKRI agencies are pulling a variety of programs and levers that are emerging emerging technologies through. I guess I was interested in how policy for emerging technologies and program design for emerging technologies is formulated here in the UK, and, and to what extent, in the context of regulation, issues to do with anticipating regulation and engaging with regulators have. Right, well that's a big question to unpack from that, we'll take a bit of time, but I won't take a bit of time. It's just worth saying that they first invested in revolution because they didn't really realize at the time it was a revolution, I think all of them. And you could say that at least we do realize there's a revolution going on this time. But this is actually something we learn from history, because uh, some of the things that happened with the first industrial revolution and the light movements that broke the new technologies, it's relevant to understand that because uh, some of the same issues uh, are live today. Um, so, policy making in relation to emerging technologies. Well, the first thing to do is to do a horizon. That is, work out what the really emerging technologies are um, and what their potential is. And in some senses, you can always look from two perspectives. So, you can look at the perspective of who are the innovators, who are the people that are discovering the relevant science, who are turning into the application, and of course discovery and innovation are two separate things. They're intertwined with each other, but there are different skills needed for both of them, as I'm sure you can this on this panel. So it's something about identifying the right people, and then if you are a funder of research and innovation, as we are, it's about having schemes that enable those people who are exploring the frontiers of knowledge, those people that are interested in achieving impact of that potential Our job is to actually uh, work with them, uh, fund their work, um, and then from a, uh, the other perspective, uh, a lot of research gets about answering questions. And of course, new technology enables you to answer questions in ways you couldn't before. Um, and it's actually a paradox that if you look at the people who get Nobel Prizes, most of them are the people who develop new approaches and methods and technologies. Very rarely gets on asking grant and grant to answer for that. But so the other lens is from the applications, and other what problems can be solved. And in many cases, actually, people are driven to develop new technologies in order to solve new problems. Um, from a government perspective, I think the interest is twofold. It's A, how can technologies uh, tackle the problems that government face, be it delivering services better, where information technology or AI and health. Obvious, of huge potential to solve problems. Um, but of course, the other issue for government is when to step in, when to regulate, when to leave and learn. And I'll just maybe end by saying that I think one of the things that is most important when you think about technologies is not thinking about them generically. And what I mean by that is it is a ridiculous question to say are genetically modified organisms a good thing or bad thing? The question is always what gene, what organism, what purpose. And I think that applies to every gene. So in this industrial revolution, there's no question that these are powerful technologies. They have the capacity to do good things, and they have the capacity to do bad things. And actually, they have the capacity to do both at the same time. Um, and so the challenge isn't, I think, so, is AI a good thing or a bad thing? Um, it is a technology which can answer a lot of questions. Things, um, you have to look at it in a very specific way. And the challenge for government is to, on the one hand, create an environment that enables the benefits to be reaped for all of us, and at the same time, provides an environment where government can provide this gap. And when it looks as though there is a potential harm to step in, and that's a very difficult. But I think that the danger of government is stepping in too early and also missing the Thank you very much. So uh, there's questions coming in already on Slido. If you've got specific questions for Mark, keep them coming. They will stay uh, on the screen.
if people want to vote for them, please, please do. Um, and given your role with GE and uh, the work with the Brie Institute in terms of uh, health and well being and, and some of your activities with the, the Brain Health Project, I'd be interested in your thoughts on insights into how healthcare and medtech sectors are being impacted by the industrial revolution, emerging technologies, and I suppose in that context, uh, your interactions with the Brazilian government. With governments in general. Governments in general. Yeah, I, 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 just, um, I say that the research and innovation doesn't have. Nationality, so to speak. I mean, it, it, it happens, um, and, and, and the best research and innovation to produce new pets have been um, happening in, in a collaborative way. So, um, as, as President of Chile, I'm talking a lot with our government, and there are also government affairs in Latin America, and I'm talking with the government, and I have the privilege of also interacting with the government because the Chile healthcare uh, headquarters is. So, uh, as a British company, <laughs> we had to uh, encourage them here too. But uh, I wanted to start by saying, talk a little bit about the Fourth Industrial Revolution in healthcare. So, the Fourth Industrial Revolution, as, as it was already said, it's, it's happening as we say and as we speak. And it's changing the way we live, the way we work, and the way we relate with one another. And it's changing fast and changing in a very non linear way. So, it requires a different approach, it requires different mindsets, it requires uh, a, an approach that I, I am beginning to learn now as, as an entrepreneur and I welcome everybody to look into it, which is to consider ourselves as complex adaptive systems, like our bodies, our um, companies, our cities, our governments, and this revolution more broadly as a complex adaptive system. So it's, some properties that exist in complex adaptive systems are very important for us to be aware of when we talk policy. And one of them is emergent. Self-organization is also very important. So um, in this new era where multidisciplinary knowledge is so needed to tackle the global challenges we face, we need to be able to understand that systemic process and have a systemic approach as corporations and also as governments to leverage the benefits. And also, of course, like it was already well said, to be able to notice the, the potential abuses and stop them before they cause pro bigger problems. Right? So in healthcare, it's not any different. We have had so many advances and are still seeing more coming. Uh, only the knowledge of brain plasticity for me is mind blowing. And the fact that we can change life is, is so near uh, to us and, 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 and so important. It is, healthcare is the most common concern of people because without health, we don't have anything, right? And, and yet, uh, the cost of treatments these days, the model that the healthcare systems are built upon these days is unbearable. So we are in the middle of the change. This is happening very fast. And we need, um, the, the agents in the innovation process and the agents in the regulatory processes and governments all over the world to find a better way to communicate and act fast. Um, I will just uh, mention a couple examples. When I was the GE, uh, some technologies that were being created at that time um, enabled us to interact with government because it's, it's sometimes easier for, for the regulators to understand from the, the creators of that technology or the, the, the companies commercializing that technology to understand what it was intended for, what the applications are, but to see it happen in practice. So one example is um, a, a small uh, scan, uh, an ultrasound that was created by GE in India called V-Scan. So this was originally created to help midwives in rural areas in India to uh, save lives, and uh, so they could, you know, take a, a, an ultrasound and avoid several problems when the women were having children in remote areas and did not have access to hospitals. But then it turned out that this application was very, very useful for triage in, in certain facilities, not only in rural areas but also in big cities. And then we, we, we stepped into a, a huge regulatory issue, which was oh. Only doctors can uh, use ultrasounds. You can't have nurses use ultrasounds. So they have to be trained to use ultrasound. Although this was a very easy plug and play kind of technology, very handy, and you could even have a doctor look at it remotely from a distance. But the, 
trained to really do the regulatory process as is. So having global technologies being developed globally and being used globally, if you could have some kind of a, a, a global a place for vetting the usage of these technologies and associating with the opportunities and the challenges that the technology and widespread and misinformation the public allow the adoption to be faster. Because usually you have from two to five years of regulatory process for new technology, emerging technology, and five to ten years for adoption. You can, in this fourth industrial revolution, you can't wait ten years for the adoption of new technology to, to come to place. So you have to be able to engage it in a, in a different way. And uh, you are only going to be able to do that if you, if you build trust. And uh, collaboration is you know, only going to happen in a good way if, if it's built on trust. So governments have to, to protect the users, the patients. They have to make sure the monies are spent wisely, right? And they have to promote innovation, like I was saying. And every agent in society plays a role. So academia, corporations, governments. And uh, I, I, I'm very happy to see that uh, playing the role of corporate and so public-private partnerships in, in the world, there is room for a lot of conversation and dialogue and, 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 uh, and alignment. And in the fourth industrial revolution, especially in healthcare, it deals with people who are so delighted. We need to make sure that this process is work smoothly. Thank you very much. Um, thank you for the questions coming in. I, I do notice that one of the questions is about the volume. So I don't know if, if it's possible for colleagues to turn the volume up uh, slightly. Um, Bill, as, as loudly as you like. Um, from your perspective, I mean, it would be really interesting to hear about what needs to happen for effective innovation of emerging technologies. But the, your perspective in terms of the role of venture capital and startup firms in terms of innovation in emerging technologies. And, Maybe a sort of secondary question, personal question as well. I guess in the, in the third industrial revolution, when it was about scaling up IT firms, cyber firms, without physical capital, that was one thing. I think one of the interesting features of the fourth industrial revolution is this sort of cyber physical, highly complex systems. And I'd be interested in your thoughts as well on how VC approaches investment in big, complex, cyber physical systems technologies. Well, so I can begin by confusing the topic as much as possible because I don't see a major disjunction between the emergence of IT from the spillover from the military to the commercial world circa 1980 and the digital revolution that we're all living with now and which is informing every aspect of innovation including for example genomics, personalized medicine, um, uh, additive manufacturing, that is the rendering into from atoms into bits and then back to atoms. In fact, I think that is a, a major theme of what we are learning how to live with or choosing that we really have a problem with living with some of these consequences of the digital revolution. Let's try to make that a little more specific and break it into some pieces. So it became clear as we emerged from the global financial crisis itself, very much a consequence of the digital revolution, of the construction of what Warren Buffett called financial engines of mass weapons of mass destruction, which were not possible without the application of computers to financial data. Uh, as we emerged from that, it appeared that we, we really had merged, emerged into a world in which the digital revolution had matured. And that can be observed in various ways. One is the emergence of disruptive web services employing relatively small numbers of people in some cases, uh, but where the cost of developing a new technology, uh, a new application, I should say, this is what I kind of think of as the degenerate phase of a technological revolution, when the technology is so mature, as electricity was by the end of World War II, that it's open season for in innovators to develop new applications, whether they're special toasters or whether they're uh, car services uh, available on demand. Um, so those services disrupt existing markets. They eliminate technological frictions that had existed. But they encounter new frictions, and this gets to the regulatory point. In fact, one of the real challenges for the genius entrepreneurs of Silicon Valley broadly defined is that they think 
the only frictions that matter are technological. That the cultural, regulatory, political frictions that Uber has encountered city after city, that Airbnb has encountered city after city, can be dismissed. You know, it's the, 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 the phrase is it's, it's easier to ask for forgiveness than to ask for permission. Uh, but they tend to get wet. So that's one area. The second is, for venture capitalists, the ease, the, the radically reduced cost of launching a new venture has transformed. It's an excellent paper that uh, talks about how, the academic paper, on how venture capitalists have had to shift gears from the notion that, the way I put it, every time you write a check, you're writing a second, if you like, virtual security. You're selling a call option on your time and your energy and your expertise to go in after your money and try to turn that venture into a real business. But you can't afford to do that in the digital world. Uh, world. So there's a new style of investing called spray and pray. Little bit of money into everything that moves. Give them a year, tell them to come back in a year, see if they've accomplished anything, and then decide to which of those ventures will you actually write the call option take it seriously and try to build them. Now there's another dimension of where we are in the digital revolution, and that is the fact you've got these lots of genius young new companies, but you also got some very large, hugely powerful, enormously profitable enterprises, which have around the world awakened a different category of regulatory response. In the United States, we have begun, finally, to rediscover antitrust, anti-monopoly. You may have noted that 50 attorneys general of the state, in the context of a federal government that seems to be more concerned about keeping scientists from playing any role in formulation of policy than actually fulfilling the assigned statutory and constitutional missions of government. So the states are moving in. It's a very complex constitutional kind of structure in the United States. But this reflects this, again, the maturation of the digital revolution in the form of the Facebook. And now I'll, I'll finish with one final point. Historically, every technological revolution that has mattered has depended on two institutional buttresses of support. One has been at least a permissive of not actual, actively funding mission-driven state, going back to the role that the British state played in allowing railway promoters basically to force the taking of land from landowners so that they could build railroads, all the land in Britain was already on. To obviously the role of the Defense Department in the Cold War in sponsoring all of the technologies from silicon to software that combined to make the digital revolution. But there's also been a second buttress, and that's one that we're seeing a very curious, very, uh, I would say probably unprecedented form, and that is financial speculation, financial bubbles. The mobilization of capital, investing in securities whose prices are completely decoupled from the underlying cash flows, past, present, or future, that all of you who have ever taken a finance or an economics course should be aware, represents a fundamental value. So the railway manias in Britain in the 1830s and 40s, the US in the 1850s, the 1920s in the US were not just about the Charleston and bathtub gin, it was also about building the electricity grid that made the, the electrification, the general purpose technology of its age, and of course the great tech bubble of the late 1990s, uh, which funded the build-out of the internet, but also the exploration of what the technology was actually going to be good for. That's where Amazon came from. Um, today we have a, a phenomenon that I, I, I just want to close on, which is the unicorn bubble. The unicorn bubble. Because for the first time, you have institutional investors buying securities that they can't sell, and investing on prices that are at premium to what the public market would pay for fear of missing out. Fear of missing out on the fangs, the next Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google, whatever it might be. It seems to be 
coming to an end. But we should always, if you like, respect the ability of the financial markets to lose their mind collectively. Most of the time when they do, what they're investing in are tulip bulbs to desert houses of the Nevada, the beach houses of the Nevada desert that will never generate any productive return. Occasionally, they finance railways, electrification, the internet, and create a new economy that changes the world. So the real question from where I sit with respect to a, a fourth, not the fourth, but a fourth technological revolution, how do we collectively mobilize, beginning with the United States, in partnership with China, the state focus on response to climate change, and then generate the global financial bubble to fund the accelerated mobilization of resources and the development of further, for example, energy storage technologies that are absolutely necessary. If the Defense Department hadn't existed, if Stalin had died in 1945, the digital evolution would still have occurred. General Electric, AT&T, IBM in 1945 already experimented with how to get to solid state physics. But climate change won't wait. So. I think we'll come back to climate change. There's a lot of related questions there. Um, Claudia, um, having read um, more national government strategies for industrial digitalization and AI than is, is healthy for any one person. I'm very impressed by some of the documents that come out of your company on, on uh, AI strategy for Mexico. Uh, so I was just interested in the process that Mexico was going through in terms of strategizing for AI and developing policies for AI, how they engage with stakeholders, not least regulators. I'd be very interested in your thoughts and insights on that. Sure. So um, in Mexico, the, what, what we have today in Mexico is a first report on the basis for national AI strategy. For that report, we analyzed strategies across the world to understand you know, what were the different areas of focus, what were the, the different areas that, have, that, that seemed to, what were the different trends between the different strategies. And that first report aimed at informing uh, different stakeholders in Mexico, the entire ecosystem, on what was achievable in Mexico, what the, and, and recommend areas of focus. Rather than really, I mean, at CMIND, the way we work, we work in collaboration with the entire ecosystem for this. And rather than it being CMIND saying, hey, we need to focus on this, we worked with the ecosystem to see what their main concerns were, where they saw the potential of AI in Mexico. And from there, we decided that the only way that it would be logical to continue moving would be to still continue working with the ecosystem. So we co-founded AI 2030 MX, which is uh, Mexico's national coalition for an artificial intelligence agenda, where the way we're working is we've divided it into different groups, uh, groups that look at, for instance, um, the academic aspect. From CMIND, we're leading directly the ethics group, because we believe that ethics is not a conversation that needs to come afterwards. It's a conversation that needs to be embedded in everything that you're doing related to tech development. And each group is preparing kind of uh, insights and what the, what the strategy should look like from their angle, which we will then to put together in a national strategy. And I think one of the biggest challenges when we're talking about um, policy, strategy, regulation, is simply knowledge. Do the people who need to make these decisions have the knowledge necessary to make these decisions, to decide what kind of policy should be into place? So, what we're doing is, number one, trying to generate more awareness. Awareness of what AI is, awareness that AI is not some sort of magical beast that is going to appear with solutions, that it's rather about pattern detection. We're trying to share that idea, trying to share that knowledge with government, um, in particular, not only at a national level, but at a local level. And working with them to see what kind of policies should emerge from that. And what does that mean? So I want to talk about um, a pilot project that we're carrying out in the city of Guadalajara. I know that a few of you are from Guadalajara. Um, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so um, the idea there is, okay, so what, what does it mean for the government to be involved in AI? How can it work with the academia, uh, with startups? How can it learn how to do it? How
quite a number of things. Number one, that carries pilot projects for the um, focusing on the priorities of the state. So for instance, health, uh, diabetes, that is, that's a huge challenge in all of Mexico, particularly in Jalisco, which is the state of Guadalajara. Um, how can we tackle that challenge using AI? And the way we're presenting AI to the government, and I think that this is a much um, more common way to present it than the way the media is presenting it, is AI is another tool in your toolbox to continue addressing the same challenges that you have been addressing. It's just a new tool that you can use, and sometimes it will apply, and sometimes it will not. So let's explore together where it does, what it means to be using artificial intelligence. Because yes, AI is about developing algorithms, but it's also about developing the conversation that goes around AI um, and extracting knowledge from that to create better public policies. So all of that we're doing with the government. And at the same time, we're going to be promoting uh, social entrepreneurship by, by creating these, these pilot projects where um, startups can participate, that create more information, basically feeding, um, feeding the startup with this new tool that is AI. And uh, that's one of our pilot projects that's, that we're carrying out. Um, among, among the idea is also, so just to clarify, that is a pilot project that involves different pilot projects. And we hope that that will be super helpful in involving all of the areas of the ecosystem in these discussions. They're going to all be involved in the development of these pilot projects and the discussions that come with it. What we don't want, for instance, is for the ethical conversation to come after, right? It's not a matter of, for instance, if you're a company and you develop a product and then you go to the legal team and say, hey, is this, is this legal? Is it okay? Can we send it to the market? Maybe they're going to say no. So you need to make it legal by design. In the same way you need to make it ethical by design, you need to, you need to share knowledge about the ethical problems that can happen. So that's why we're so excited to be working in this, in this group of incredible, um, not only organizations and government agencies, but incredible people, because that's, the, that's who we work with. It's not just with the government, with people in the government who want to change things, who want to more open to understanding how technology can help them be a better government, can help them serve people better. So that's a, a very exciting project that we're working on. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Uh, great insight into engaging with the ecosystem and pilot projects and, and ethics. Maybe you return to this theme of maybe like in the context of, of healthcare, sort of. I, I guess um, AI in the context of, of health. I guess you've had interesting engagements with the National Health Service, which is an interesting, important part of the ecosystem, not least given all the patients. Data they have, and some of the sort of issues around confidentiality of data, who owns the data, who share the data, who share the data with. Uh, so, be interested in your thoughts on uh, an experience with that kind of engagement in the ecosystem and, and lessons learned. Yeah, sure. That's a tough one. Um, so, better being last on the panel, I like to say I agree with a lot of what talking before. Uh, in particular, a lot of what we were just mentioning about what is AI. I think this is a key question. I think there's a mystification around what AI is. There's a lot of language which is used, a lot of buzzwords which are used about AI and machine learning in general. I think it's clear to say that actually what we have as AI right now is narrow AI. Right? So we're not talking about what might be the fifth industrial revolution, which might be AGI, which is generalized intelligence. We're very much focused on narrow intelligence for solving particular tasks. And I would say going beyond this, um, what we consider as AI right now is largely being as a consequence of what is known as deep learning. It's a particular type of technique or particular a particular type of architecture for developing neural networks. But actually, if you reframe what a deep neural network is, it's actually just statistical learning from data. And actually, you know, people in the audience have probably written regression tests and linear regressions, logistic regressions. If you think about what a deep neural network is, there's nothing more than just a series of these regression units stacked one upon each other. And so the real kind of power which comes from applying these techniques actually when we have these masses of data. Not just the data, but also the technical infrastructure and architectures which would be open source. So this means that actually developers, developers all over the world, so you know, people in the audience 
because I'm sure might have a duplicate open group and coding away at some problem which they can pull data from from the internet. So they can pull data from Wikipedia, they can develop a machine learning model and start to make predictions straight away. So this is giving people access to the tools and techniques at scale to develop solutions at scale. Now we talked about, in particular in the, in the realm of healthcare, the key, the key kind of considerations here are a bit ethics, but also bias. So bias is key, uh, and this is something which is uh, kind of made worse by these deep neural network technologies. So this is why actually a lot of the research which we do is the development of so-called causal models, so causal generative models. So here you explicitly write down the causal mechanism which is, which is created your data, or which has created the signal. And because of this, you can have interpretability and explainability. So in other words, if you have a result, a prediction or a recommendation to a patient, you can go back and have humans in the loop to assess why a particular prediction or recommendation is being given. And that's really key. So just to reiterate, it's the interpretability and explainability, and also the issues of bias in the, the data, which are exacerbated by some of these uh, technologies and techniques which have been developed recently. Fantastic. Um, I have quite a few questions here, just, just a couple of quick questions. Um, so Mark started off by talking about learning from history. I, I wonder if people have examples they can point to of where for emerging technologies innovation has been inhibited, where the wrong the emerging technology trajectory wrong pathway happened because of regulation or the wrong nurturing of governmental policy. Well I mean obviously you can debate what's happened with GMOs where there was public debate and broadly across Europe it's been extremely to introduce uh, GMOs into the future. Um, and I, I just want to touch actually on something that Adriana talked about. But I, think I think the danger with all this technology is that we really have got to look at it the lens of how it changes people's lives and also the lens of people's beliefs and values. And so the ultrasound example is actually very interesting because that's the world of genes and mechanisms. Um, and of course, it's a great thing to diagnose and use it to explore how the things are developing in pregnancies. But you can also determine the gender. And that has very big implications in a country where at least some people don't value females as highly as men. And so that actually created quite a big problem. Because actually if you democratize in a life that can be early in pregnancy to work out whether a fetus is male or female, that has major consequences. And it's an example, I think, where we just have to look at technology again and again and just think there are the beneficials of this. Uh, the, the beneficials of AI are obvious and essential. But of course, when AI is used specifically to influence voter behavior, then that may not be quite so straightforward. Um, I think part of the issue with GMOs was going back to my introductory that it was treated as though it was a simple thing. You know, this isn't good technology, it's just a ridiculous question. Because unless you look at it through, let's say, what gene, what products, what purpose. But I also think you have to understand that people take values in this direction. And there are some people who believe you shouldn't fit with nature. Now that's actually not a scientific belief, it's a religious belief. Um, and I think that too often the researchers and technologists have discussions at cross purposes. So they think if we explain what a genetic that will somehow solve the problem. It won't actually, because there are some people, and this is more people, by and large, they think it is just fundamentally unacceptable. You don't have a meeting of mind, and that's your own problem. And that's where regulation and democracy is really because we live in broad societies where people are actually large and are And at the end of the day, it is the role of government in democracy. And indeed, not democracies as well, because the role of government is to sort of finally make decisions. And it's where I think the UK has done particularly well in embryo technology, because that is highly contested, it is highly regulated, and yet we have developed IVF in a very sophisticated way. We recently agreed to uh, potentially prevent the transmission of mitochondrial disease by a very technology. And that's an example of really good regulation. Where you had a regulator for public consultation and you've had policy makers who thought about it on a very careful way. Yeah, I, I wanted to pick up on, first of all, and I thought the very 
and the focused application. We both say, what is called AI, and frankly, as a venture capitalist, whenever anybody approaches me with the terms AI, I know I'm being promoted. Because I know enough about machine learning. I knew Hap Nielsen in the, in the early days of neural networks. Uh, the applications in these well-defined areas were extracting information from very large data sets still leaves you with the question of what is the data mean? And that meaning is going to be contextually dependent. And learning the context, whether it's about a GMO argument or whether it's indeed about something to do with social policy. So the, the, the most extreme negative example of the misapplication by governments of enormously powerful tools like machine learning in the United States is being contested right now. It's over these systems that have been developed for recommending, really, in a sense, preempting decisions about sentencing, parole, where the data itself reflects our history, our 400-year history today, our history of slavery, Jim Crow, and it's embedded in the arrest and imprisonment statistics, which go to feed the systems, which extract the patterns and say, these people are more likely to recommit crimes than those people. It's an extreme example, but it actually is absolutely current events right now in the United States. The, the top voted question at the moment is, is a sort of related topic. It's how do you envisage tackling the inequality that seems to exist extensively in new technology? For example, lack of uh, treatment into female medical Investment in female medical treatment, gender bias in big data and AI. Do you have anybody has any comments on, on that or other sources of bias and how we should deal with them? Well, I'm just saying, I mean, one thing that's finally become, but so Mark, you will have something to say about this, I dare say. The fact that clinical trials historically have been very heavily weighted towards white males in increasingly heterogeneous societies, but societies that began with 50 50 heterogeneity before any immigration took place is something that finally is being addressed and the challenges of creating much more relevant clinical growth. And you're absolutely right, because this is not a new problem of AI. No, no. no. Oh, no, no. It was heavily loaded against children, for instance. So right. it was heavily loaded, basically, to the market. Right. The market was adults rather than children. Yeah. And the, the market of care was loaded against those conditions and those individuals.
more inclusion. And I'm talking men and women, but there's a lot of other uh, inequalities that can happen from that. And that's something that companies need to have in consideration, that governments also need to have in consideration. And here, I think the concern with governments, again, is that they don't really know what AI is. So how, how can you even start to talk about this ethical aspect when there's this, this base knowledge? So I think that's a huge concern. Um, that, that tech might create more inequality. That's, that's a very real concern uh, that needs to be addressed and needs to, there needs to be more conversation around these topics. So, yeah. I think uh, there's often this idea that you know, we're just flooding the data. All organizations, all companies are flooding the data. But just again, it's, it's obvious to say this, but there's just so much bias and character in that data. But actually, what we need to get to is a paradigm of kind of human empathy. So I don't think we're at the place right now where we can just let a, uh, a model learn itself on the data and let that model run. We need humans and we to actually validate the outcomes. Um, so I think that's the first point. So that's increasingly uh, important consideration for regulated industries, healthcare, finance, uh, legal sector. Um, in terms of the application to clinical trials, that's an interesting one. I think. Um, yeah, I'm going to myself slightly by saying there is a lot of data out there. There's a lot of data which is not in clinical trials, it's in the real world setting. So, what we can use machine learning artificial intelligence for is what those techniques are good at, which is crunching large volumes of high dimensional data into lower dimensional spaces and be doing comparisons to or essentially trying to identify similar individuals. So, in this setting, you can do what are known as virtual clinical trials. So you can actually identify similar individuals in different arms of the population and then run a series of simulations to say, you know, we expose this cohort sort of population to an intervention, what is the outcome? It's not getting to the gold truth, we've got the gold standard, which is a randomized control trial, but it gives you some information. It's not the answer, but there are some techniques out there which can help. Are we looking at predictive analytics to try to avoid making the animal studies that are run to Yeah. And you 
don't have a very direct contact with history, and indeed, in the first place, you don't have contact in the Rohingya, for example. Um, and so I think one's got to be very careful. We feel that it's safe in our society, and it's not true in all societies. And I think, you know, we've got to look at business models as well. There are business models that connect. And actually, a very good example is the implementation of mobile money in Tesla. That's a good example because it's actually enabled people who were unbanked, who had very poor market information, get market information and ready transfer money for their banking system. That's absolutely great. But equally, there are business models that disconnect to leave people behind. And so people who aren't well connected, who are elderly, who are less well educated, can be left behind. Um, and I, I think it's the point I've made before, which is there is no single right answer. The technology offers huge potential. But I think the word trust is And I think the corollary of trust, as Honora O'Neill of this parrot trick say, is trustworthiness. And I'm afraid every time a company demonstrates that it is untrustworthy, it actually causes problems for the whole sector. And so I think business responsibility is easy to say. Because this is really no one stuff. There's no single right answer. Oh, wait. If I could just add, uh, add to that, I, would, I was just going to finish my point by saying um, I think that the solution is also looking into new, new models, new ways of sharing data, such as data trusts, which is something the Open Data Institute is looking into to, to bridge this gap. Just to finish. I am under extremely strict instructions that this is going to stop at 3 o'clock. I know that some of the panels are hard deadline. Um, I'm going to have one more question, and I'm going to clumsily try and cram a number of questions together into one. It's always a good idea. Um, I was just wondering for the relevant panelists, do you have thoughts on whether the fourth industrial revolution will affect Latin America differently to other countries, given this is a conference around what can be done between Latin America and the UK and shared experiences? So, will we impact Latin America differently? But more generally, I guess for, for other colleagues, are there opportunities? What are the opportunities for international collaboration? <laughs> In terms of supporting innovation of emerging developments in the fourth industrial revolution, including anticipating issues of regulation, just how important is that international collaboration? I'm going to make one very quick point. I knew you would. Every, every follower nation has gotten to the frontier from Britain with textile technology taken from India and Italy, through the United States, to Germany, to Japan, to Korea, to China, by appropriating all the available intellectual property that they can get their hands on. It's not, that's not an ethical judgment, it's an historical observation. Over to you for Latin America. Um, well, the fourth industrial revolution is about technology advancing globally. So I think the, the effects will be global. Now, the benefits and the challenges might be local to the extent that some countries might impose barriers to access or to discussion. So, the, 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 to the extent that you can actually have communication channels working at the, the nodes in the networks very fluidly exchanging the, the pros and cons, you will be you'll get better equipped to make decisions. Because of very important and big risk of this first industrial revolution and technology advances is manipulation. So how do you avoid being manipulated? Right? Because if you see it in so many subtle ways that it's very hard for you to know if you don't have the information. So the flux of information, the, the flow of information, um, and the trust. And, and the way the systems operate in a way that you can actually act upon it. Like uh, in, in the Latin America, we have a big issue with corruption, and the companies applying more and more compliance uh, rules to themselves and governments trying to put that uh, to use too. So, so what is the, 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 the best approach to compliance? You have to have the right mechanism in place. You have to be able to educate people of what can be done and what cannot. Because some people will act because they don't know what the right way is. So educate, have the right uh, processes and mechanisms, but act fast when you notice something is not wrong, that is not working right. So same thing with technology. Like you were starting out with that. It can be good and bad, and it can be both good and bad at the same time. So how do you bring the light, bring 
to light the issues in a very you know, uh, mature way and deal with it front and center, but then not hide it because we need to move fast, but we need to move in, in an ethical way and not to cause too much harm. I think Latin America also has an opportunity to work together in this. And I mean, a lot of the countries of Latin America are represented here. This is a great step. Um, understanding uh, what, what is being done in different countries in Latin America. And one of our biggest challenges in terms of AI and using AI for impact is that there's not so much visibility of what each one of our countries is doing in Latin America. Uh, a lot of the projects is AI for impact. I don't see any place where all of these projects are being compiled. But one of the things that we are pushing for from CMINES in the... So, so I told you about the, the Fair Jalisco uh, project. This is part of a regional pro project called Fair Lac, which we're doing with the International uh, Inter-American Development Bank. And the idea there is to create a repository of all the AI for impact uh, exercises, pilot projects that are happening in Latin America, and mapping key actors in each country. And that is one way that we can help us help Latin America advance and learn from what's happening there. So that's collaboration within Latin America. And if you know of any pilot project going on in your country, I would love it if you could email it to me so that we can include it in the or, or tweet it, you know, uh, so that we could include it in the mapping. And in terms of, of collaborating with the UK, I think there's huge opportunities. I mean, the UK is pioneering a lot of different topics. Um, I think open, open banking is an interesting topic that we can learn from in terms of opening uh, industry data in a safe, reliable way. And um, we've been, we created a report last year around open banking working with the UK for Mexico. And, and now in terms of, of AI, the, the entire data trust conversation is also one which we're very interested in in Mexico. We're interested in, in piloting, sorry, piloting it through Fair Jalisco. So I think there's, there's incredible opportunities um, to, to work together, to learn, and also um, from, from the Latin American side to share stories of AI for impact and how AI is transforming, um, transforming challenges in Latin America. Thank you. In the interest of time, I will give a very final word to Sir Mark Walton. Okay, just very briefly. Uh, UK spent billion 